So I've recently come to realise that an awful lot of what I'm doing stems from a very early childhood memory. And I must have been less than two, and I must have been running around in a playpen on what was a cattle property before all the introduced pasture grasses and legumes and garden plants had started um, taking over our habitats. And I had the sensation of running around and having poor little creatures fly off in all directions. And I realised I've spent the rest of my life trying to regain that, ex that experience and I can't get it very often because most of the time we've wiped out all of the brown covers, at least in the Brisbane Valley. Um, and there's only a few places where there's a, an inkling of the kind of diversity that was once there to make that experience possible. So, um, yeah, so that's the source of the, a whole lot of what I'm doing. So, um, are any of you raising caterpillars or putting butterfly gardens? No? Nope. Yep. Put in a butterfly garden, raise caterpillars? Excellent. It's a really fun thing to do. It's terribly engaging and it's also very inexpensive. So, and it's a fantastic thing to do with kids. Uh, Amelia is my daughter, who I might ask to pipe in if I'm saying something that she remembers better than me. Um, but my children were raised on her and my brother were raised on raising caterpillars. So I've raised um, 75 different species, hand raised by finding eggs or larvae and having the food plant or knowing where the food plant was and bringing them inside and getting all of the photos that um, you'll be seeing. So I really actually only started it to get photos so I could remember and tie up all of the life cycles of the species. So um, what we have here, I'm going to do a very quick life cycle of the lemon migrant, which I probably did on, uh, on Monday as well, but I'm just going to flash through it. Just sort of, I'm hoping that people see how much of a transformation we need to have in our perspectives of life on Earth. And I like the, transfer, uh, the transformation of a, an egg to a, a butterfly and then renewal as a metaphor for that. So here's a lemon migrant egg. It's highly likely to become food for that caterpillar. Uh, there it is, almost impossible to see as probably one day old. It took me something like three weeks when I was doing lemon migrants back in 2000, uh, sorry, 1986 when I started raising the species. Um, we kept bringing in leaves to feed the big caterpillars that we found and we kept having new caterpillars um, to raise and eventually we were to see what little caterpillars and eggs looked like. But up until 2015 when I did a new batch of them, I've spent a lot of time talking about butterflies and their life cycles and beneficial beings and I would say constantly that we you know you've got a lemon migrant caterpillar if you've got a green caterpillar with a black and white stripe on one of its food plants. And then in 2015, they showed up with no stripe. Little rows of dots that made them look like yellow migrant caterpillars and coppery on coppery leaves. So what I learned from that is that we're back basically all metaphorically blind people feeling the elephant. One person gets the trunk and says a trunk is like a giant hose. Um, the other person gets the flank and says, oh no, an elephant, sorry, if I'm off the wrong word, an elephant is like parchment. And the third person says, who has the, the, one of the legs? No, it's like a big, strong, strong pillar. The point being that none of us ever have the whole story. And even if you think you've got the whole story, you're, in nature, you're probably completely wrong. So um, that was my lesson from 2015 of um, raising a new batch and um, being quite wrong. Anyway, here it's done, it's shed its skin four to five times, um, which is what they need to do to be able to grow. It's attached itself by a tail and it's built itself a silk sling, which, in, um, which all of the butterflies that are in a group called the whites and yellows, as this one is, and the swallowtails have, this is all that remains of any sort of cocoon type structure. And not all moths have cocoons either, so. Anyway, so it, um, it's formed its pupil skin underneath its caterpillar skin, and 
and here it is emerging with its very soft pupil skin and it wriggles and squirms for ages. I've saved you hundreds of photographs in that sequence uh, to just show you a few. Oh, hundreds of them. Um, it um, showed up in two colour forms as a chrysalis and here it is emerging. And it's taken me hours to get these shots because you sometimes have to sit there for two hours and they're all handheld before the thing does, looks like it's going to do something and then doesn't do it straight away. So there's um, a nearly inflated wings. They're still a bit crumply. They sit, settle. Uh, so the whole purpose of doing this initially was to be able to get new butterflies because if you ever try and get them in nature during the day, they're too fast. You have to either kill them or put them in the fridge. The time you can get... The best photos is when they've recently come out, pumped up their wings, hardened their wings, and they're getting ready to fly. And then and a large number of them very obligingly sit there for a few minutes, opening and closing their wings, which these have done. Now, there's a lot of these butterflies on the wing at the moment, and the bird people saw masses of them out near the office. There's a Cassia Brewster eye out there, so I think that's what they had been using, but I haven't checked to see. So um, what I did mean to say a bit earlier is if, there's, if you have a question about any of the slides that I'm showing immediately, please make sure you get my attention to ask it. If it's a bigger question, please hold it. If with the pupae you said of that caterpillar, it already grows from the inside. They don't make it with their mouth. Yeah, no, they don't make the pupal skin. Even in the even in the species that have cocoons like silkworms, they're still doing that same thing, but they've built a shelter of silk around them first. They do not they do not build their pupal case with silk. They only build their shelters with silk. So they might stitch leaves together, and they're always laying a trail of silk. Um, so because one of the definitions of lepidoptera is their silk users. But they, they're very variable in the amount of soup they use. So, were there any other questions for that sequence? Because, yeah, there's a lot of not, people haven't understood much about the life cycle. Yes, it must be so strong. So it is. Sorry? Um, that is a few threads of silk. What I didn't show you, because I haven't got really a, photos that you can really tell what's happening, but they attach themselves by the tail. They're still held before they pick when they're getting ready to pupate, they hold themselves on with their some of their legs somehow and they bend their heads back over their abdomens and attach themselves backwards and moving their heads backwards and forwards so that they end up with the silk girdle uh, there. So it's no longer got its head, but it, when it had a head, well, it's got a head, but it's not a head with silk producing parts. So it had bent that head around spun the thing across its body several times. Um, they don't do it for long, probably about 10 threads across. And a lot of that silk, they, they've got different types of silk for different purposes or different compositions. So you can sort of see it shrinking up a bit as well. Did that answer the question? Anyway, so transformation posts, we need to completely rethink what we're doing. So this butterfly has nine different colour forms. Some of them are male, some of them are female. I haven't got the space to try and associate them. I do all of this in a worker's cottage on a kitchen table. So we're um, exploring three main questions. So, um, yeah, so we're looking at interplanting as much as anything gardening with nature so I'm becoming a stronger and stronger advocate for local regional ecosystem planting um, because of all of the other effects that happen when you're actually planting with the nature that was there originally or nearby um, so um, so how can we promote more butterflies and their preferred insects? Why gardening for species diversity does increase some um, preferred insects. I actually don't even like the word beneficials. Um, and the idea of how do beneficial um, 
a species work. You can't even have beneficials if you don't have the creatures that are considered non-beneficial. So it's, we've, got, we've got really limited language for understanding, in, in common parlance, we've got very limited understanding language for understanding what's going on. So uh, do I need to address questions like um, uh, the difference between nectar and host plants? Are people familiar with that difference? No. Okay, because a lot of the stuff that's out there is about plant nectar plants for adults. I don't even bother because butterflies are not very host specific about the plants that they collect nectar from. I've not yet found a single one that is host specific. I might need to explain that. The vast bulk of creatures on the planet are very specialised as to what food, insect species, but are probably all other creatures without backbones, about what species they eat. And then there's a few things that are generalists, so they're called specialists, and then there's a few generalists. So we're, we've, been, we've been led on this idea that caterpillar will eat anything, but it's just can't be further from the truth. I blame uh, Alan Carl for that one. Um, but anyway, it was a counting book. It was a massive lost opportunity. Um, but anyway, so nectar plants will feed passing adults and it potentially prolongs their life. But adults are actually just basically like wind-blown seeds in a way. They're the dispersal mechanism for the species. They're the thing that attracts us and the first thing that usually gets people's attention is see, seeing a butterfly sipping nectar and and then because everybody's seeing the sort of garden variety plants like buddleias and durantas and uh, pentas that are in this range of vision, the story gets out there that we have to plant those plants for butterflies. It just couldn't be further from the truth. They had plenty of nectar sources in the environment before we planted some European um, nectar plants. What's really important about increasing the number of butterflies is growing the specific food plants for those that, that species of caterpillar eats and that's what I uh, concentrate on. Um, so and the only caterpillar that's eating vegetables that's a butterfly caterpillar is the introduced cabbage white and it evolved to eat kale so we can't really blame it for eating anything in the brassica family that we're growing like it's not their fault um, but um, and there's a you, there's a very small number of more generalist moths and some of them have the capacity to um, to eat a wider range of species and they're the yeah the, the generalists give all caterpillars a bad name but they can't help it that's how they evolved so um, I'm just going to skip some of these because some um, we're running a bit late so there's a whole lot of different ways to do beneficial gardening um, so one of them is to provide passing um, a nectar for passing butterflies and other insects that are nectar feeders because we're getting a lot about pollinators and needing to put in flowers for pollinators. Um, I've done a, I've done several books. One of them is Create More Butterflies, which is about 48 butterflies and their host plants for this region. But more recently, I um, with Dick Coatman, I produced um, Inviting Nature to Dinner, which is about integrating native plants into food gardens as well as if you don't want to do food gardens, you could just do native plants anyway. Um, and I lost the point I was trying to make. Sorry, I've been talking non-stop all morning. So. Um, yeah, so it... Um, so the concept of having a lot of nectar plants is really useful for the bees in particular, but there's a whole lot of bees that are really host specific. So we have something between uh, 1,700 now named native bee species and there could be as many as 3,000. So they're saying 2,000, but there's an awful lot of cryptic species hidden when they start doing the DNA on a species, they think it's one species, they're finding out it's four or five species. Because our our capacity to see the differences is just, we're limited by our perception. So, so the most common uh, idea about doing beneficial gardens is producing nectar plants. But there's all sorts of other species besides bees that are, are um, pollinators. So there's all sorts of flies are very good pollinators. Red-tailed maggots form a, a, the larvae 
Sorry, I have to explain reptile maggots. They're these <laughs> amazing little maggots that live in the most putrid of water. Really putrid water. But they have a tube that extends out of their bum and it comes up to the surface and they can breathe through the bum. And they pupate and become really cute flocks. So I'm being very scientific here. Yeah, that's a very scientific term. Cute. We've decided, haven't we? Cute, cute is the most scientific word to describe an animal on the planet. They are gorgeous flies, and in New Zealand they're doing work on putting in really smelly drains for drone flies to be pollinators. So I'll address a bit more of the pollination thing because a lot of people think of bees and flowers as, um, as um, beneficials. So hoverflies, uh, there's a lot of research being done in Canada on different species of hoverflies because they can be amazing pollinators. Just because you've got a bee doesn't mean you've got a pollinator. And I did say this, if there are any people here from this morning. In an awful lot of situations, bees are robbers of flowers. They're not doing any pollination service at all. And honeybees, because we're hearing a lot about how honeybees are declining, they are not a native species in Australia. We do not have plants that evolve with them as their specific pollinator. I'm not sure which European crops they may have evolved with that they do require honeybees more particularly. But, um, yeah, so there's, I think it's a massive opportunity to start thinking about what we use as food because we've narrowed our diets down to this very limited range of European and a few other crops from a few other places. And we've been so busy modifying them to take out any of the chemicals that probably are good for us, but can the plants can defend themselves better. And so we're, our breeding processes generate monsters. But anyway, so I don't agree with the concept that if honeybees decline, it was attributed to Albert Einstein. He was a physicist, of course. <laughs> He says, uh, if all the bees just, de just uh, die, we haven't got, um, we're dead in four years. Like, sorry, it's just not true. But we might have to eat things that we weren't used to eating. Um, but if the processes that kill all the honeybees kill all the other insects that are pollinators, that's a different story. Um, anyway, so there's a whole lot of different approaches, and I've tried basically all of them. <clears throat> I'm now up to planting for wildlife and I've based it on a whole lot of processes of planting for host plants for butterflies, but it's been a good way to learn how to do it. But I wouldn't, if I was starting again now, I wouldn't start with uh, host plants for butterflies anymore, but that's my own evolution. So, yeah, so we started with some nectar plants, planted some ones for conservation because then the birdwing vine became something that you did. Doesn't grow on slopes and ridges particularly well, died, not a good plant to plant in that situation. Um, then planting very specific plants, irrespective if they weren't local native plants, uh, if they were introduced plants, as long as they fed a butterfly got planted, I'm busy slowly removing all of those. I've come across this really interesting conundrum. If you have an investment in a plant for some reason, even if it's not something that's at all useful, it's really actually very hard to get rid of it in a lot of cases. We, we end up attached to plants that we put energy into. Anyway, so um, so this is a rough and ready list. If you're living anywhere near habitat that's native, uh, like not badly mangled, I would be looking at what are the plants that are in that habitat that you can extend into your garden. But I live in the middle of suburbia on a property that was um, strawberry farms in the 1800s. It got settled with housing uh, in the very late 1800s and it's been completely modified. So anywhere where, if you are putting in plants that could cause problems in bush, but you're living in the middle of the city, I don't think you've got the same issues happening. So that's a plan for any dead ordinary garden where you're not paying attention to um, local habitat requirements, which was fine in the process of doing so. Um, and some of these are good habitat plants. So um, I'll, I won't cover these so much. I'm mostly covering, I'll show you a sequence now of um, life cycle slides of um, food plants we can share, because there's sort of 
interesting little flow ones from a whole lot of them. So the native guava, it's not a guava at all. We have some plants of this down the walkway. We have had this little butterfly on it. I think it's a beneficial thing because there's a whole other story to be told about pollination with this plant. The plant is really ancient. It's related to magnolias. It's in that family. And it needs to be pollinated by a specific species of weevil. So if you don't have the weevil, you don't get the fruit. The fruit makes for a spice that's showing up in the bush food industry. And I know it makes very delicious flavoured white rum. <laughs> and if you ever want to try it, there's rainforest liqueurs up at Witter and they make it and sell it. It's really nice. Also very alcoholic and you don't try it afterwards. Um, but um, so I'm trying to change the perception of beneficial and I reckon I can ch hopefully change it even more with this one. So uh, native mulberry comes in male and female trees. It... Um, it re reasonably reliably feeds the uh, Jezebel nymph butterfly. Uh, this one's mimicking a toxic butterfly. The caterpillars are gregarious uh, and in their earlier stages they do this spider formation. So one of the potentially what would be called normally beneficial insects is tachnid flies because they are, there's a whole family of flies called tachnid flies and they have larvae that basically eat caterpillars from the inside out and kill them, which is useful if you're trying to keep, if you have the right species of tachnid fly for the right, for the insects that you've got that you don't want, like caterpillars on plants. Some of them are more generalist, some of them are more specialist. But in this situation, they can protect each other's flanks um, from being, becoming fly blind. But if you ever get an intact group of the 40 eggs that are laid, there's, there's nearly always a runt. I'm calling it a runt. It's always stuck on the outside. I know from very intimate experiences, because it was happening in my bedroom, I had a big enclosure where I was raising these particular creatures at one stage in the mid-90s, and they, the, the group of them would all eat at the same time, digest their food and sleep at the same time, shed their skins at the same time, pupate at the same time, except for the runt that would always just do it out of sequence. So the speculation or you know, an explanation is that if a bird comes along and sees a yummy meal, it can grab a lot of them all in one go and the chance is that you've got at least one survivor. And if a technic fly is coming along, it's more likely to be able to get the, um, or, a, or a, a wasp, it's more likely to be able to get the, um, the runt, for want of a better language for you. So even in this photo, they had all pupated, but this was the front. I'm going to have to find a better word for the poor little thing. Huh? Well, no, it was just runt of the litter, you know, the little, the little one. The outsider. The outsider. It's the outsider. Anyway, so, um, so yes, so part of the discussion in Inviting Nature to Dinner has, is about... What can we be growing with our other crops that increase species diversity of predatory or parasitoid organisms that are more generous that can you can use and trans, that will transfer to the animals that you want to try and keep off your crop or at least keep to a much lower number. So the other really good thing about this plant is, um, and most people won't think this is good, but it's a really good host for the giant hedge grasshopper which a lot of people love to hate. But for a perceptible period of time, two or three years in the middle of the 2000s, a crested hawk would come into my garden and it would spend three or four days there and you would see it diving into the native mulberry. I didn't see what it was eating, but it could only really have been eating that. Um, and I think it must have died because it didn't come back after three years. And a friend of mine was not so long ago standing under a eucalypt and there was a crested hawk above her and she got rained on by um, grasshopper parts. So she, but there's photos of them catching stick insects as well. So they, they eat things in the orthoptera, I think is the name of the family that grasshoppers are in. So there's all these little ecological flow-on effects that you get by planting host plants for butterflies is uh, what that's about. 
And so, yes, yeah, so, but we need to work out how to recreate the conditions so we can all have more crested hawks in our gardens. <laughs> Maybe taking a whole lot of the insects that they, we don't want, like well, they, we don't want as for food production. So I'm just, I think we just really need to think about how we can be much more creative in working with nature. This one's a bit more of a ringing because it's just one of my, they're all my favourite at the moment I'm talking about them. I just really love the caterpillar. Uh, it's a food plant we can share. Uh, Erythrita acuminata is this one. It's a quickline plant. We've got it on the walkway. There's a um, scaly-breasted lorikeet eating the fruit. And the fruit of that's quite sweet and yummy. A um, bit too sweet, but not as yummy as um, another. There's another plant on the walkway, Glycosmus uh, trifoliata, uh, pink lime berry. Um, that hosts another butterfly. So um, part of the story here is that sometimes you get these caterpillars, that's its head end, that's its tail. They're really weird looking caterpillars and they hide in a debris field at the end of the, the leaf that they got laid on. In some places the caterpillars have got a whole lot more white dots and it is speculation but um, there's some reasonable chance that they are pretending to be the eggs of the tachnid fly that will eat them. Because if there's a lot of eggs on a, on a caterpillar, the fly might be cued into not trying to lay on it because there's not much point. Because you really only ever get one tachnid fly out of every caterpillar that I've ever seen, even if it's got four or five eggs on it. If, if I, when I've raised it through, I've ended up with one tachnid fly. So, so it's not in the fly's interest to lay on a caterpillar that's already been tagged as becoming a fly. Um, and there's... Just totally peculiar, but this and the um, Jezebel nymph before it has got chrysalises that look like little bats, <laughs> and we don't. Nobody knows why, but if you look at them, they look like little bats. And I think it's a difference in our sensory perception with maybe birds. Um, so, I, so that one's in there partly for this part of the story because of tachnid flies. It's really worthwhile if you want to do something for beneficial insects is to have caterpillars so you have more tachnid flies and any tachnid flies that are more generalist can get your caterpillars on your crops. But people have to start doing the work on which... So there's tachnid flies that parasitise aquatic snails. They're not going to be the ones to attract to the garden because they're only going to eat snails. So, we, you know, the work isn't done on this, but it's time we started doing it. So there's... Um, Three butterflies that have um, started feeding the Fusca swallowtail, which I haven't got here, and the dainty, uh, and the orchard have adapted to eating citrus. And um, and you'll also notice that citrus is an introduced plant. And you ever, if you see it in the bush, because people spit out seeds, it doesn't seem to disperse itself very far. At the time I was doing a first book called uh, Butterfly Magic, <clears throat> there was a woman at um, UQ who was doing a research project for orchardists, uh, citrus orchardists, and she put out a book on 48 species of spiders that were found on, on citrus. So, so the order of the process is the sun produces energy for the plant to grow and produce all these different sorts of chemicals and proteins that the first order consumers, the caterpillars and the bugs and whatever, eat. And then the second order consumers are the parasitic flies, the, um, the predatory flies. We saw some beautiful um, robber flies out on the walkway today. Um, wasps, all sorts of other things are second order consumers. Some spiders are second order consumers because they will eat caterpillars. Um, but then there's spiders that eat spi specialise in eating spiders. So as soon as you've got spiders you know you've got some complexity going in that particular little patch that you've got. So for this talk, this slide, I mean, I just want to show my butterfly slides, but this slide is in here because I can talk about um, citrus orchards. And, and it's really great that they're not, that citrus isn't escaping in the bushland. Is it well, good to have spiders? Sorry? Is it good to have spiders? It's absolutely good to have spiders. I'll hopefully get to species diversity. I... Most people I need to do the special, the sequence of individuals first and then big stuff. 
Um, so that's the orchard. We had a nearly mating pair, but we decided to leave them in peace to perform their rituals alone. Um, capers. So it's in here because I've been told by the very people that produce um, that very delicious um, Bawara flavoured white rum that um, the native capers are extremely delicious and much nicer than native capers. But it's going to be fairly hard to keep this plant in um, cultivation because there's at least five different butterflies that eat it. Um, and I didn't quite manage, but I uh, found a Bora caterpillar eating the uh, um, flower. It just bumped out of me. Uh, the flower is not so long ago. So there's all these things that are eating it. So I think it's a very beneficial plant because even if you don't get the caper buds, you're likely you're, you're just increasing the species diversity by having it. And in the past, as um, as uh, settlement took over the valleys around here, a whole lot of the, the stories have it that the cape, the native capers were taken out because they most people see them as horrible prickly plants. Um, so every few years, somewhere, well, every year basically, somewhere on the eastern seaboard, there's a, usually a report on the media about mass migration of caper whites. There's a few other butterflies that come in with them, uh, check it swallowtail being one, and um, they build up big populations on their host plants west of the Great Dividing Range uh, and quite far inland. It's a very widely distributed butterfly, and then they eat themselves out of house and home. Uh, and migrate eastwards and it's a population dynamic because mostly you're wanting to keep population explosions reduced and doing nature gardening would reduce your population explosions of any creatures but this is one that just has been reported since from early settlement so um, the capers survive quite happily and the butterfly still exists so there's no harm being done because and I'm hoping that that is an illustration because quite often people are saying their plants are being smashed by something and they think that it's going to kill the plant. And it might kill some plants, but that's not to say that those plants should continue to exist because those plants may not be chemically, I hate the terminology, but fit enough to actually survive. And what we're doing is we then grab all the seeds off a plant, propagate them and expect them all to live. They shouldn't be living. There's only a few that should ever be making it through of any species. There should only be a few making it through. Um, but anyway, so this one comes through in masses and migrates back south a bit. So, um, so I, I don't know if there was some form of population regulation mechanism for it. But So we can eat that. And just as soon as there is a mass migration, I tried to... People at QUT were doing a research project on uh, a new introduced disease to control some caterpillar. And um, at the time I had a really, it was 2016, there was a really mass migration through Brisbane that year. They had already started breeding on my um, capers uh, in August. And um, they come through, they used to come through in the first week of November. You could set your calendar by it. Anyway. She sent her technician to my place to collect um, caterpillars and chrysalises and so that they could test it out. And every single one that they took back to the lab had already been diseased or fly-blown or there was something wrong with it. So that's the, so the, the control agents, the things that the general public describe as um, beneficials had caught up with the population that was in my garden. And my garden is an isolated patch. The, the only other place I know of that has got capers is um, uh, Bank Street Reserve at um, uh, Ashgrove. Uh, there might be a few plants here and there between. They're just not. They're not a common plant, and they're not in nurseries at this stage. You have to. You have to be somebody that's gone looking for them. But I have about seven or eight plants. So the other butterfly that feeds on it and comes through is the caper gull, and then there's at least three other um, pearl whites. So I've got a striated pearl white there but there's a northern pearl white and a southern pearl white, and I think I've just been raising one from North Queensland because it doesn't look like any of the other pearl whites. So purple moonbeam is in here partly, I can tell a, 
I've done this for so long, I've got all sorts of stories about the things that have eaten my caterpillars when I've tried to show them to people. <clears throat> so sandpaper figs are not good at producing figs if you've got them away from a creek line, but if, you've got, if you're near a creek line, they support quite a lot of creatures, including a fig beetle. They support this absolutely beautiful little, it's about that big, um, butterfly that's opalescent pearl white with stripy legs and stripy antennae. It's just, it's, there's a new scientific word, it's adorable. adorable. <laughs> it's adorable. But I reckon even the caterpillar is adorable, but you have to really get your eye in to look for that one. I have a really good phone. Huh? I have a really good phone. I have a, we're discovering the, at least Sandra is and I am vicariously discovering the advantages of a really good phone. Yeah. Completely surpasses the technology I bought to do these photos in 2006. <laughs> doesn't come within a shine of it. Anyway, the upshot of this interesting, well, this ecological story is I used to run um, the butterfly department, other than Bedworth's department at the festival, and there were a whole lot of people dressed in real butterfly, representing real butterfly costumes. And down on the green there, we had some um, of these caterpillars, and they were pretty mature, and I was going to show a few of the volunteers what the cycle was about and um, and I knew exactly where the caterpillar was and of course we went down there and the caterpillar wasn't there anymore <laughs> and just one leaf above it was this beautiful green, oh. big green katydid exquisite creature and it's sitting there <laughs> uh, oh no. I reckon it was cleaning its legs and I I bet my bottom dollar that it ate the caterpillar it wasn't any other like it might have been something else but a whole lot of those katydids are predatory as well. There is now one katydid that is adapting very quickly to garden crops, which is annoying people, but there's a whole bunch of them that are predatory. So um, indigo flash is very much a wet, mostly, sorry say, a wet, like creek line plant, a uh, butterfly, except that... This is more a story of how much how it, how we can all be contributing to citizen science. So, my ex and I were growing um, a miller miller. Uh, it ranges down to the New South Wales border in the border ranges. It's a delicious fruit, and I say that I don't eat fruit on the whole, but there's two or three fruits that I will eat, and it's really delicious. And we had these really weird looking caterpillars on it. They're a little lysinid. Uh, and it hatched out into this um, indigo flash. Um, and I've tried raising it a whole lot of times, but it's they're nearly always parasitised. So that one was in there just because it's more uh, we can be growing our own fruit and supporting other insects. But the whole other point of it is that if you start raising life cycles, because while well, butterfly life cycles are reasonably well known and reasonably well documented now, um, Butterflies are, in Australia, about 400 species of Lepidoptera, and Lepidoptera could be as many as 20 to 40,000 species. We just don't actually know. So, And most of the other Lepidoptera, the larva and the adult, haven't been associated with each other, or at least if they have by someone, it's not in common literature just yet. So, um, so that one's there to encourage you to use our naturalist now. Um, Record your caterpillar if you can raise it. Most of them are easy to raise in little takeaway containers, provided you've got a food source. Some of them you can't, but, you know, we basically have to do it to find out which ones we can and which ones we can't. We can't do tailed emperors, I'll tell you now. Um, but, um, but, yes, it's a case that we're going to have to try it and we need to document as many and associate as many larval life forms with their adults as possible. And we did that in this case. So soap trees, I'm still trying to get a handle on that. Every single slightly more mature um, Alphatonia excelsa is full of holes. So I was talking about this to some um, wildlife people saying I wanted to produce stuff. And one of the, person, the first person, several people did it, but the first thing was, what's eating the Alphatonias? Um, so far, I think I've got 10 different insects that are eating it, and I keep planning to do a little video, but I haven't managed to make it yet. 
So, but the reason for putting that in is that if you are near bushland or you've been planting native plants, it is a really good idea. We really need to know what the associations are. If I haven't already said that, let me say it again, even if I have. Um, if you can be observing one or maybe two plants throughout the year, morning, noon and night, and documenting what's landing on it, what's eating it, if it's la something lands on it once, it might be just coincidence, but if it's a constant thing that you see, then there's probably an association. <clears throat> there's nothing in the system yet that is documenting ecological relationships, and that's what we need to know. Um, IDing things is great because that can help you in that process, but we really need to know what's eating what. But um, I'm running out of time, so I think that's... So you can eat um, the bases of mat rushes, but I'm going to... I've kind of covered some of that. So the, the insects that eat plants, their role is largely unseen. They're nature's tip pruners, they're composters, and they're very largely food for other animals. And they actually have a really important role showing up in plant speciation. So there's papers on um, how insects eating plants progressively changes the chemistry of plants and this then causes plants to become different species over time. Um, anyway, the, I'm going to get into the critical bits um, with not much time left. Douglas Tellamy has written a book, several books now, but uh, he's a professor of ecology from Pennsylvania. He compared his local native woody plants with introduced plants that were marching across the landscape as they do here. And he found that the local native woody plants, and we're not even talking about ground covers, supported 35 times more Lepidoptera biomass. And I'll just leave for those of you that haven't come across that terminology. Um, biomass is roughly the equivalent of weight. But 35 times more caterpillar weight of caterpillars and moths than did the non-natives. Now if that was an if that was a percentage that would be three thousand five hundred percent more food for the rest of the ecosystem. And the bit of information I got from um, Daryl Jones, who's a professor of wildlife urban ecology or something at Griffith Uni, sorry I've just gone and forgotten. His claim is that all terrestrial Australian birds feed their nestlings insects irrespective of what they're eating as adults. And that may not be true for raptors because they're already eating protein and catching protein, I don't know. But, but as a baseline, an enormous number of seed and fruit eating birds are feeding their nestlings insect, irrespective of what they eat as an adult. So that, that, those two bits of information together really got me started on, well, got me really going much more on how important it is to have your local native plants. And so, yeah, so local native plants also support vastly less diversity of plant species other than we don't know about citrus, but it might be an exception. There's very few exceptions. So this is very rough and ready. Um, we're represented by the elk in terms of all things with backbones. That's all mammals. That's all amphibians and reptiles. That's all birds and that's all fish. So if you take the area in there covered by those and compare it to all the other animals, so I don't think I've talked much about invertebrates yet, but at this point in time, 19 out of every 20 named animals on the planet, and that's the ones that have then been described by sort of taxonomists, 19 out of 20, every 20, is an animal that doesn't have a backbone. So... That's enormous, and we know we actually know virtually all the vertebrates. Um, there's seventy-two thousand five hundred, just shy of five hundred of them, according to the IUCN list. We've only named one point five million invertebrates. Invertebrates is a very—it's a colloquial term that covers at least um, thirty-three phyla of animals, so a very diverse group. The chance will be that. 
it's much closer to like 99% if more of the work's done because there's all sorts of estimates about how many we might have described out of all the invertebrates. So my core question is, and people will already heard me say it a few times, if there are so many invertebrates on the planet and we keep focusing on the things with backbones, where are they and what are they doing? And they all evolved to have very special, specific niches and their, their roles are not interchangeable because people think, oh, if one insect can do it, then another insect can do it too. They might be able to do parts of the behaviours and habits of an animal, but they're usually doing something else somewhere else and um, possibly not as constructively. So species diversity, folks, is all in the creatures that are spineless. So um, Amelia, my daughter, came up with a great line, so I attribute to it. Since they don't have backbones, they can't stand up for themselves and we need to do it for them. So nothing like having a way with words. So to get my head around those numbers for that Inviting Nature to Dinner book, I drew up this circle. So if we, we're just talking about all named animals. So that's all the things with backbones. This represents all of the this all of the other animals that are named. This represents all of those all of those animals that are insects. This represents this whole circle represents all of the insects that eat plants roughly. This darker pink circle represents all of those insects that eat plants that are specialized in what they eat. And this represents the 0.34% of all of the animal species on the planet that have pest potential. And we do know them because that's where all the research work goes. Thankfully, some research work is going somewhere because it does tell us something about the amazing relationships. But our view of life on Earth has been skewed really badly for a very long time. And it's nobody's fault. It's just doing this work made it really clear to me how much we have to rethink how we consider life on Earth. So let me jump to this is um th this is a bunch of um, predators and parasitoids that turned up as I was doing more butterfly host plant gardening. So these would, even though people don't like wasps, they would have to be probably the most beneficial insects on the planet because a whole lot of them are pollinators as well as some predatory or parasitoid. This one had found a hawk moth had bitten off its head, had uh, butchered it very neatly and taken out its digestive tract and was bundling it up to take it back to the nest. <laughs> These ones catch live caterpillars, as far as I know, and stick them in the cells. It sounds gruesome, but if you think about their habits and they can't help it and our habits as a species and we can help it, um, I think we win hands down on gruesomeness. Um, this is an absolutely gorgeous... Human and wasp, they are parasitoids, so they um, lay their eggs in whatever animal they are, and I think some of them are highly specialised, or groups, uh, and then that eats the cat, eats the creature out and it becomes a wasp. It turns out, and I only recently found out, that this absolutely amazing bauble is actually an introduced um, wasp that was introduced to control nocturnal moths. I'm pretty sure it's eating a whole lot of different moths. That was the, yeah, anyway, sorry, distracted. So it was, I'm pretty sure it was eating the lemon migrants that I had because um, it was on the Senna Lodichordia. And so, again, a bit more to tie back in the um, beneficial insects. Um, that's a lacewing, and lacewing have very predatory larvae and are reported to be predatory. I've just never seen them eat as adults. So ant lions in the soil are a type of lacewing, but there's a whole bunch of them. There's really cute ones that carry the carcasses yeah. of the insects. They've eaten on their backs and bits of leaves and twigs. There's four different genera of those. And it turns out, because I had to look because I was confused, they can tell each other apart by the sounds they make. According to Atlas of Living Australia, I don't know where they got the information. They call them junk bugs. Huh? They call them junk bugs. Oh, I'm not calling them that. I'm just calling them cute little lacewing larvae. Cute little lacewing larvae that carry their dead on their back. So there's a. Don't get. Don't find these and let them accidentally stab you because it is painful. Uh, but there it's eating a three line beetle that people like to think of as pests. Um, 
That is the larva of a um, clearwing swallowtail, and there is a technic fly that was stalking it, but I it didn't it was stalking it to lay eggs on it, but it didn't succeed. At that stage, I was a bit precious about my caterpillars, so I've gotten less precious now because I know they all eat. Um, and that was me as an ecologist already, and I still didn't get it. Um, but anyway, I did raise that one through, and I have got its whole life cycle. Um, and then uh, that's a jumping spider, and they some of them specialise in other jump in other spiders, but a, a number of them uh, really eat um, insects. I've got I've got one on the back of my book where it's catching bug. So I'll oh, skip one. Sorry, I'm just going to do a. The reason for having the um, monarch in here is it's really useful plant for seeing population cycling. I'm not advocating growing it. A whole lot of councils have it as a, listed as a, uh, an invasive species or a pest species. As far as I can tell, it's only a pest for horses. And let's face it, they're really economically important animals these days. Um, for horse racing <laughs> and riding. Um, but anyway, what happens if, I've, I've seen this often, but it's it's a useful little exercise in population dynamics and population ecology. So you grow the plants, they get nice and lush. Sooner or later, a monarch will find it, or a lesser wanderer, but much less often. <clears throat> so the caterpillar starts eating the leaves and demolishing the plant, because that's its composting role. And if you've got enough plants, sooner or later you start having... Uh, Tachnid flies coming and you end up with flies. But the plant has this little tiny yellow aphid that must have been introduced with it. I'm pretty sure it's not a native. There's 11 or maybe 13 species of native aphids in Australia. All other species are introduced. Anyway, the plant quickly starts attracting um, or getting populations of the aphids growing up it. The aphids get eaten by a little tiny parasitoid wasp that can complete a whole life cycle in one aphid. Uh, lace swing a larvae come along, hoverfly larvae come along. <coughs> so there's predatory hoverfly larvae, as well as pollinator adults. Um, so you'll see this really funny looking, I know it's a maggot, but it wouldn't look like a maggot, it's a bit mobbly. So they eat the aphids. Um, ladybirds, different species of ladybirds will turn up and um, their larvae are predatory as well as the adults. Uh, they're the main ones that I've seen on it so far. And so as your plant is sort of collapsing under the weight of all of the things that have eaten it, it's hopefully spread its seed a bit, it's not too far away from where you wanted to grow it. All those populations of all those animals crash and then it all starts again when the seeds grow up. So I, I like it as an example. I know that all of that is happening out there in the wild but you just can't see it in one place in front of your eyes. So, um, But I'll uh, call it quits there. Uh, hopefully I've actually shown you why you would want to be gardening for herbivorous insects because that actually then supports the ones that we might like better. Because then the other option is there's a growing movement to buy in beneficials. And I have some concerns about what that will be doing, but I won't go into them here because I've, I think I'm seeing some less than positive effects. Um, so you're welcome to stay in touch with me. I've got one more talk on um, Saturday on butterfly, uh, native bees and um, stingless bees and um, pollination, but I've just covered some of it already because some of you did want to come to that. Um, yeah. There's all different ways to catch up with me. And are there any questions? And my books are available in the general store. Can you come forward? I can't do that. So I um, used to work for Bunch of Violence in Australia, yeah. which is, yeah, um, no. yeah, you know Bunch of Violence? Yeah, so, I looked them up. Yeah, I was just wondering your opinion on, um, I guess, like exporting beneficials into agriculture, at, like to displace pesticides. What's the effect, uh, like, on the rest of the... Yeah, I, I have my concerns about... 
largely because like I haven't, I'm not doing the research. I'm a science communicator. I'm seeing the effects. That bauble of a, a chrysalis, as far as I can tell, I can only find it on Cabby. It had been introduced into Western Australia to control new noctuids. I haven't seen a noctuid on my center. What was it doing there? And it doesn't show up a lot, but it's showing up a bit. But the one that's concerning me a fair bit is um, there's a lot of, I've raised a lot of orchard swallow type caterpillars and had them go through and they pupated nicely um, and from like late stages brought in. I have been bringing them in. On the Facebook pages about butterflies that I've been visiting, there's an increasing number of photos of uh, a, a little incarsa wasp yeah. that's um, ca catching the orchards and the buscus swallowtail at that pupation stage and then kept that kills them. Now, that may not be a bad thing, but it's, it seems to me that it's a new thing. Based on my experience, it's not research. I just, the idea of that inviting nature dinner is diversify what you're growing in the understory. Half the time the problem is if you're, if you're just planting your plants in rows or whatever, and it's basically denuded underneath. You're not giving any capacity for the biodiversity that could be there that could support the plants to grow. And that, so that's, but you know, I'm not saying that that can be applied to large scale agriculture. I don't know. I'm not. I'm, I'm no expert on it. I just think when it's not a, it's it's another commodification process. It's not a ecological process. Yeah. So and and. I'm trying to get people to think about ecological processes. So I, I don't want to bag it because I can see why it's arisen, but I think it's possibly distorting, especially if it becomes available to garden every gardener. It could start wiping out all sorts of other um, biodiversity um, because you're artificially increasing the population. So it's a, a standard. If you, my ex was growing a, um, a stand of host plants with, wanted to get into the host plant business, like a metre square of different species of host plants, the butterflies, if they're FIFO jobs, fly and fly up butterflies, the butterflies would find them, they'd lay eggs um, and just be selling sticks in no time at all. I was trying to get people to like pre-loved plants, but it hasn't caught on yet. You have to go out and ask every nursery for what are their pre-loved plants. Sooner or later, I'll see that it's quite worthwhile selling plants that are sticks. Eventually, he got around it by just chucking all the seeds and seeing what's alive. Yeah, yeah, that's. Yeah, just letting it grow. So, you sort of grow the seeds into the pots, or just let themselves seed into the pots. So you get probably three or four different roots plants in each pot, and then sort of. Once the butterflies come through, you have a certain number of survivors, and then you sort of grow from there. But you couldn't plant one in a pot and expect to have anything left to sell at the end. Yeah. Anyway, so um, yeah, so I, I think that there are just massive number of untried strategies, and I'd love to encourage people to start exploring them and talk to a few people about different ones. But, but I think interplanting is going to be a much better option in the long run. Okay, because there's, sorry, uh, yep, I'm already going to over time. Sorry about that, Andrew. Do you need to escape? Thanks so much, Helen. Thank you. Thank you.